Will the assassination of a top Hamas leader in Beirut change the course of the war on Gaza? Israel stands accused of killing Saleh al aruri in Hezbollah's stronghold in the Lebanese capital. So what will the reaction be? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Puranam. It's being seen as a major blow against Hamas's leadership. The assassination of its deputy chief, Saleh al aruri could signal a new approach by Israel to its war on Gaza. The top commander was killed in Lebanon's capital in a drone strike, raising the risk of fighting well beyond the Strip. Israel has neither confirmed nor denied its involvement, but said the strike was not an attack against Lebanon. Nearly three months into Israel's war on Gaza, al aruris killing will likely intensify hostilities between Israel and Hamas. So how will this affect the course of the war and will the conflict expand beyond its existing areas? We'll explore these issues with our guests in a moment, but first, this report by Katia lopez Horian. The assassination of Hamas's second most powerful commander, Saleh al aruri could be a game-changer. This killing in a drone strike on Hamas's bureau in Beirut could signal a new front stretching well beyond Israel's war on Gaza. Shortly after his death, Hamas warned it will retaliate. It's an act of terrorism in every sense of the word. It's also a violation of Lebanese sovereignty, a violation that represents an expansion of Israel's aggression against our people and our nation. The Zionist occupation is completely responsible for any repercussions. The Israeli government has not taken responsibility for the strike, but it says all Hamas leaders in or out of the Gaza Strip are targets following the October 7th attacks. As one of the founders of Hamas's military wing, Aruri helped build closer ties between Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. His assassination is a blow to both, and widely seen as a warning to Iran and its proxies. This is not something that uh, is going to resolve any of the major issues here. If you get a full-out war between uh, Hezbollah and Israel, you're going to have a lot of destruction, and both sides are eventually going to have to have a ceasefire. The death of Aruri will likely complicate, if not end, ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas, along with any deals to release hostages. Israel has a long history of killing top Hamas commanders. Now the strike in the center of Hezbollah's leadership in Lebanon appears to signal a change of military strategy. Across the occupied West Bank, supporters of Aruri called for revenge, saying his death will help strengthen their resistance against Israel. As we always say, uh, one leader is going, more leaders is coming. So this is not the end. And uh, if they killed one of the leaders, more leaders and more uh, Palestinians will take the flag and will continue the, the fighting against this occupation. Some analysts say the strike has shaken Hamas's leadership and embarrassed Hezbollah leaders in Lebanon. The focus now turns to whether they will retaliate against Israel and whether that could lead to a wider conflict. Katia lopez Adoyan, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests. In Beirut is Maha Yahya, director of the Carnegie Middle East Center. In Tehran is Mohammed Mirandi, professor at the University of Tehran. And in Istanbul is Sami al Aryan, director of the Center for Islam and Global Affairs at the Istanbul Zaim University. A very warm welcome to all of you. Ms. Yaya, I'll begin with you in Beirut. How could a drone have carried out this attack in Lebanon? How could it have stayed in Lebanese airspace long enough to have done it? It's clear that there is some sort of a security breach uh, from from, what, from from the information we've gathered so far is that it was a drone attack. It was accompanied by someone on the ground pointing to uh, where the apartment at which uh, Mr. Aruri was at that particular moment. 
Uh, at least this is the preliminary information we've gathered here. Um, it's it's not that difficult, unfortunately, to breach uh, Lebanese airspace, uh, in part because of the weakness of aerial defenses in the country. So um, it wouldn't be. The, it's not the first time, and unfortunately, I doubt it will be the last. Okay, Mr. Morandi, how is this attack being viewed in Tehran? The killing of an ally, and not just any ally, but the man known as the go-between, two resistance groups linked to Iran, Hamas and Hezbollah. Well, it is very significant. He was viewed in Iran as a hero for the resistance in Palestine. Uh, he's had a very... Uh, difficult life uh, as a result of the threats made by the Israeli regime. Hezbollah warned the Israeli regime about any strike, so uh, uh, the assumption is that uh, the, there was always a fear that he would be ultimately targeted. Lebanon is, of course, a, a place where uh, Israelis have uh, infiltrated uh, the the country for many decades, and it's not very surprising that this is, uh, has been carried out. But uh, even though this was a blow, but I don't think it's going to have any impact on the way in which Iran supports the resistance, whether it's in uh, Gaza or elsewhere. Uh, the, the structures that exist and the cooperation that exists between Iran and the resistance groups, and in particular Hamas, is uh, very long term and uh, there are many people involved. So it was a blow, but uh, when we look at the genocide that's taking place in Gaza and the bigger picture, mm -hmm. uh, there's much else also going on and especially with the bomb explosion that we saw in Iran today on the anniversary uh, when uh, General Qasem Soleimani was murdered by the Americans, many here are also uh, many here also believe that uh, Israeli intelligence could have been working together with elements of ISIS to carry out the bomb attack in Iran, which killed almost 100 people. OK, Mr. Al Aryan in Istanbul, we're hearing from our other guests that this isn't a surprise, and certainly the way that it was carried out, that it was able to happen, isn't a surprise either. But why do you think that Israel has not taken responsibility for it, despite stating many times that it would do precisely this, that it would target Hamas leaders wherever they are. This is pretty normal uh, Israeli MO operation. Israel has carried out in the past half century or so almost 3,000 assassinations. Sometimes they make assassinations. People don't even know that they have been assassinations. They think this was just a normal death, but it was a planned assassination by the highest members of the government. We got to know that we're not dealing with a normal state here. We're dealing with a gangster, with bullies, with people who are, who think they are beyond any law, international law or otherwise. We're talking about people who uh, assassinate people for uh, simply uh, eliminating them as being threat or as sometimes being perceived as a threat. So this is not uh, surprising. And let's uh, Keep in mind that uh, the Israeli government, since day one after the October 7th operation, have been threatening that they will go after many Hamas leaders. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, Mr. Khoury, they also said even before October 7th that he was num their number one target. All right. Mr. Yaya, how do you expect Hezbollah to respond to this? They have said that this cannot go without punishment. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah has said in the past that any attempt to assassinate anyone in Lebanon would be crossing a red line. I think Hezbollah will go about this quite carefully. Um, they Today, they're a bit caught between a rock and a hard place. There is a need to respond, especially as this is the first attack in, uh, in southern Beirut uh, since 2006. There has been an equation of deterrence where, you know, you bomb Beirut, we bomb Tel Aviv, you bomb Saida, we bomb Haifa, a kind of a city for city, a citizen for citizen equation. 
which frankly, since October 7th, Hezbollah has actually refrained from that, in part because they do not want to escalate matters and do not want to drag Lebanon into an all-out war. I think that consideration continues today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're going to listen to Said Hassan Nasrallah in two hours. He will be speaking about this. My expectation is that he will exhibit all the anger, all the sorrow uh, uh, at this attack. Let's not forget, I mean, Palestinian leaders were killed, Hamas leaders were killed, but also innocent Lebanese civilians uh, yes. uh, who were either passing by or lived in the same building were also killed or injured. Yeah, you say Hezbollah um, so is between, went, a, between a rock and a hard place. What about the Lebanese government? The Lebanese foreign minister has said that they have told Hezbollah to not respond, that this has to be something that comes from Lebanon itself. Just how difficult a position is the Lebanese government in now? The Lebanese government is also in a, yeah, it is in a difficult position, but it's also already saying that it will, uh, it's going to take this to the Security Council uh, and request some sort of an investigation at the Security Council at the UN. The Lebanese government's only option is really to turn to uh, the international uh, system, uh, whether it's via the UN or other systems, to ask for some sort of accountability for this attack. Um, for Hezbollah itself, I suspect that there will be some sort of a response. They need to respond, but it will not be at a scale that will uh, risk dragging Lebanon into an all-out conflict. As I said earlier, they've been trying very hard to kind of balance this out in terms okay. of keeping uh, you know, the altercations along the border without uh, uh, getting into a regional, an all-out conflict, which will have regional as well as international repercussions. Okay. Okay, Mr. Morandi, Israel assassinated a top commander in Iran's Revolutionary Guard in the suburbs of the Syrian capital Damascus recently, Saeed Razi Musavi. He was also reported to have been a key figure, you know, in what's known as the axis of resistance, which includes Hamas and Hezbollah. Are these killings putting pressure on Iran to respond? Well, definitely. They put pressure on Iran, and he was definitely involved in uh, supporting Hamas and uh, Hezbollah and other resistance groups. But I think the more important issue in the eyes of Iranians is that this is just another reason why the Iranians believe that the Israeli regime is completely illegitimate. It's not only carrying out uh, a, a genocide in Gaza, it's not only carrying out mass killings in uh, the West Bank, but it's also constantly bombing Syria. During the dirty war in Syria, it was supporting ISIS and al-Qaeda alongside the Golan Heights. It, is, it constantly violates Lebanese airspace. It's carried out terrorist attacks in Lebanon. And, uh, it, and as you point out, it murdered an Iranian general. And it carries out uh, terrorist attacks in Iran. And right today, Many fingers are pointed to the United States and Israel because of their long-standing relationship with elements of ISIS, and they believe that through Afghanistan, most probably, these terrorists came into the country. So the Iranians are saying that this regime is not just a problem for the Palestinian people. It's not just a tragic, uh, a tragedy for the people of Palestine. But mm -hmm. as long as apartheid exists in West Asia, we are not going to see stability anywhere in West Asia. And therefore, the, the nature of the regime in Palestine, in Israel, has to change fundamentally. All right, Mr. Aladian, we've seen the um, outpouring of grief in different parts of the occupied West Bank, for example, following Mr. Um, Al-Aruri's killing. How much of a, of a loss is he to Hamas, but also to the Palestinian political scene? He was known to have pushed for unity with, within Palestinian factions, with Fatah, for example? Certainly, Sheikh Saleh al aruri has been one of the leading forces for unity among Palestinian groups, particularly with Fatah and other nationalist groups. He's also been the liaison, as been pointed out, with other resistance groups outside Palestine, particularly Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad. He's also been a unifying figure uh, in many instances before, as he was leading Hamas's effort for national unity. So he is considered one of the icons of Palestinian leaders, uh, particularly in the past few years. 
And he has also been a spokesperson for the uh, West Bank in terms of Hamas. He was leading the Hamas wing uh, across the West Bank, and he was also coordinating among many resistance uh, groups as well as uh, operations within West Bank. So he's being, uh, as I said, it's going to be a great loss. But I think Hamas also has been able to be a disciplined group where they can uh, very quickly replace their leaders. They have mm -hmm. demonstrated this uh, over time, where they can replace uh, uh, leaders who have fallen uh, during the, the, the struggle, uh, where they can uh, very quickly get other leaders to step in and continue the march towards resistance. Ms. Yaya, given that Hamas can replace its leaders, and many analysts have said since October the 7th that it's Israel's objective of defeating Hamas, eliminating Hamas, they say, is simply not possible. Could Israel be looking for symbolic victories with assassinations such as this? So in experience shows us destroying organizations of this nature are practically impossible and definitely not in the way Israel is going about it. A military campaign is not going to bring the end about the end of, a, of a, an organization such as Hamas. Uh, Israel tried this in 2006 in Lebanon with Hezbollah. We saw where that ended. Um, so I think these kinds of symbolic kills are important to for Israel to say it's doing something. Let's not forget that until this moment, no one really has been held accountable for for what is seen as probably the biggest security breach uh, in in the country uh, in, in in decades. Mm -hmm. So there's been no political accountability nor any kind of accountability within the security services. So there is a need to claim uh, some wins and to say we're taking care of the matter. We're addressing this issue beyond bombing the hell out of Gaza. All right. um, and Israel has declared that all Hamas leadership, whether in Gaza uh, or in, uh, in, in countries around the world, are leg legitimate targets as far as it is concerned. Mr. Mirandi. Do you think that Israel would go after other Hamas leaders elsewhere in the region, in Qatar, for example, or Turkey, even though Qatar is a, is, has a close relationship with the United States, Turkey is a member of NATO? I wouldn't put anything beyond the Israeli regime, but so far, Turkey or Turkey hasn't done really much against the Israeli regime. They continue to do business as usual. Turkey exports $7 billion of goods to the regime, and oil flows through Turkey uh, from Baku to Israel. So I think that the Israelis would probably like to preserve their relationship with Turkey. Of course, the Iranians have been insisting that Turkey break off that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think what your previous guest may have uh, may be quite true. I don't know what the future holds, but the Israeli regime has lost this war. There's no doubt about it. In Gaza, the resistance, and Hamas and its allies, they've done extraordinarily well. Uh, and uh, Yemen is blocking Israeli ports. Hezbollah is forcing 200,000 Israelis to, to leave the north. Mm -hmm. It may be that uh, under pressure, the Israelis were involved in the bomb attack in Iran and informal sources in Israel could tell the public that we punished Iran, we, t we murdered a senior Gaza official, and we obliterated Gaza. So that would be a victory, and they would try to uh, ultimately uh, it make the public, or try to make the Israeli public yeah. accept this as a victory. Yeah, you, but, uh, but again, it remains to be seen what happens in, in the future days and weeks. Yeah, you say that Israel is not winning this war, and yet it's the Palestinians who are paying the biggest price, more than 22,000 Palestinians killed, most of them women and children. Mr. al Ariel, I could see you wanting to come in earlier. Let me ask you this. How do you think um, Saleh al aruris death might impact the negotiations, if not to end the war, but at least a ceasefire, especially given that he was uh, seen as having been involved in the indirect talks, key to in the indirect talks that were mediated by Qatar and Egypt? I think Israel has gone on a tree and they don't know how to climb down. That could be the ladder by which they can claim uh, victory and leave. Uh, I wouldn't put a lot of stock on this, but that's one of the theories taking place right now, because certainly they couldn't achieve 
none of the objectives they set out for themselves. They couldn't certainly devastate or end Hamas. Uh, they couldn't uh, 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 disarm Hamas. They couldn't win any uh, significant military victory. There are still rockets going on almost from the uh, from Gaza daily, even from the areas where they said they had occupied. They are still uh, not able to free any of their captives in the hands of the resistance. So none of the uh, none of the objectives they set out for themselves, they are able to achieve. And the world is tired of the killing, of the genocide, of the maiming, of the destruction that they have wrecked on Gaza. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go through all the the, the destructions have taken place. But certainly, the United States now has lost all its moral, if it had any in the past, any authority to talk about Ukraine or any other topic on the yeah. face of the earth. And therefore, they're trying to claim something in order to uh, justify what they had done and also in order to say that, OK, let's go to the negotiating table. Now, the resistance has said after the assassination that they broke off any negotiations and the resistance has been adamant about saying that they will not negotiate under fire, that they need to stop, and there has to be a ceasefire, and also there has to be a withdrawal before any kind of negotiations over the captives taking place. Uh, I think there will be a lot of pressure put by the United States on Arab regimes who have been putting a lot of pressure on the resistance. But I think after this assassination, no such pressure would, would, would come through because they know that they cannot trust anything that the Israelis do and I think I agree with your other speakers is that Israel is is on the verge of uh, one of the greatest strategic defeats or setbacks. I'm not saying that this is the end of occupation, but I think it has lost so much in this battle. It would be very difficult for them to sustain any kind of uh, hegemonic power that they've had and, and enjoyed in the past. All right, uh, Mr. Mirandi, Mr. Al Arian touched there on the issue of captives. Do you think that by killing al -Aruri, that the Israeli government has taken a gamble with the captives' lives if this assassination means a delay or even the collapse of the negotiations to have their own people held in Gaza released? Yes, it is quite possible that it will do uh, serious damage to the negotiations. As your previous guest pointed out, there are different theories as to why the Israelis did this. But uh, it could be that they, it's the opposite, that Netanyahu, for his own per personal interests, that he carried out this attack in order to stop the negotiations. And of course, that would put Israeli uh, captives at threat because the Israeli regime is bombing all over Gaza. Hamas and its allies have already pointed out that a significant number of the captives uh, mm -hmm. have uh, died as a result of the But what interest would Israeli Prime Minister airstrikes? Netanyahu have in stopping the negotiations? Well, Netanyahu knows that if he does not have a very convincing win, and he has lost the war, there is no doubt about it, uh, if, he, if he cannot convince the public that he's had some sort of extraordinary victory, uh, he, will, he will be removed from office, and he will have to face uh, a series of legal issues, and first and foremost, of course, the internal issue of corruption, but also they're going to start asking questions about the defeat that uh, he uh, led the country to. So um, it is quite possible that Netanyahu, mm -hmm. I, mean, it's, I think Netanyahu definitely wants the war con to continue, so this would be a valid theory within that context. But there are other forces at play, meaning I think uh, within the United States that knows its credibility across the globe has been destroyed, its soft power has been destroyed because it supports this genocide. Uh, in the United States, there are elements that want to end this, and, and perhaps uh, there, that would be another scenario, which we discussed earlier, about killing Iranians in Kerman, assassinations, mm -hmm. and then calling it a victory and calling it quits and hoping that the Israeli public will uh, see Netanyahu in a, pub, in a positive way. There are different theories, and we don't know. I think things will become clearer in okay. the days and weeks ahead. But the most important thing is that Israel has definitely lost a very decisive battle in Gaza. Mr. Aladian, I know you agree. You think that Israel has, is also losing strategically. But what does that mean for the course of the war, and especially for the people of Gaza? 
I mean, the people of Gaza have been suffering tremendously. So certainly a, a relief or a ceasefire would, would go a long way in trying to get the, the supplies needed for the people of Gaza. But there is an, another angle here which Netanyahu has been pushing, which is basically to have a regional war. Because I think, as your previous guest has pointed out correctly, that he is, he is uh, waiting for a corruption trial. He's waiting to be removed from office. So one way to prolong uh, his presence as prime minister is that he wants to have a regional wider war, particularly in the north with Hezbollah and hopefully even with Iran, because he thinks when that happens, the United States would be on his side in which he can get rid of uh, uh -huh. you know, his perception of Iranian threat vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nuclear plants. And also he wants to end the fact that Hezbollah has been a very formidable foe to the north. And he wants to make sure that he can bring back all these settlers that had to leave. And they have vowed they will never go back until he takes care of the of, of, of right. Hezbollah. So we, we, we think, a lot of people think, actually, a lot of experts think that part of this, part of the uh, uh, motivation for this operation against Aruri is to drag Hezbollah yeah. into a wider war. And I think that's one of the scenarios. I would give three scenarios pretty quickly, 10% for a larger, wider war, and about 30% for a strategic uh, hit by Hezbollah to a strategic uh, target within Israel in which it will be perceived as proper response well, for this uh, assassination, or 60% would be a more a measured one in which there will be retaliation, but uh, none of the of the options would be to do nothing. Right. There has to be something, and it could be in this order. Mr. Alarian, thank you very much for those predictions. We will, of course, be watching very closely to see how Hezbollah, how Hamas, how Iran um, retaliate. That weird, that is... Uh, Sami Al Aryan in Istanbul, Mohammed Marandi in Tehran, and earlier Maha Yahya, who was joining us from Beirut. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here, bye for now.